Because written records were unknown throughout most of pre-colonial black Africa, much of its history is lost, except as preserved in oral traditions, in the writings of Arabs or Europeans, or in the researches and surmises of archaeologists and anthropologists. Nevertheless, enough is known to dispel some common misconceptions about Africa. The peoples of Africa were not simply hunters and gatherers of the spontaneous produce of nature. Agriculture existed for centuries before the Europeans came. So did animal husbandry, in areas where the tsetse fly did not make it impossible. Iron, gold, and salt were likewise produced in Africa many centuries before the white man came, and in the late Middle Ages Africa became Europe's principal source of gold. Cloth and clothing were manufactured in Africa more than a thousand years before European colonization in the nineteenth century, and, while Africa later imported European cloth, it also exported its own cloth to Europe. Nor did the economy remain stagnant or unaffected by new options presented through outside contacts with Europe, Asia, or the Middle East. Many crops now regarded as traditional in Africa originated in Europe, Asia, or the Western Hemisphere including cocoa, peanuts, and tobacco. Most of the rice grown in West Africa today was indigenous to Asia. Both local and long-distance trade existed in pre-colonial Africa, though within severe constraints imposed by geography. Caravans were one adaptation to these constraints, providing mobile marketplaces covering long distances, though at a slow pace that could take months for a round trip. International trade extended to the Arab states, to Europe, and to India. Nevertheless, Africa's general level of development and standard of living were well below those of Europe. However, the relationships of Africans to Europeans did not remain static, but changed very substantially over the centuries. In the early centuries of European explorations along the coasts of tropical West Africa, the balance of power was by no means so decisively on the side of the Europeans as it would become in later centuries. A fifteenth-century standoff between a Portuguese warship and African coastal boats with fighting men was indicative. The weapons of the Portuguese ship were not particularly effective against either the more maneuverable African boats or against the African coast, while the Africans were unable to board the high-hulled Portuguese ship. The two sides ended up trading peacefully, as many other Europeans and Africans of this era did. European firearms at this point were still primitive, inaccurate, and slow firing, giving them no substantial advantages over bows and arrows or spears. Freebooting European marauders raided African coastal settlements for booty and captured people to enslave, but the larger European governments saw such activity as impediments to trade and sought to suppress it. Moreover, the Africans themselves were often able to fight off marauders, so that peaceful trade became the rule between Europeans and the peoples of the African coast during this era. This trade was controlled and regulated by African rulers, who were able to suspend it or terminate it whenever it suited their purposes. Not surprisingly, European traders often exchanged gifts with those who ruled in Africa, in order to remain on good terms and continue trading. This trade was not necessarily in products not available in Africa. Senegambia, for example, imported approximately 150 tons of steel annually from Europe, but steel of comparable quality was being produced in Africa, though its cost in Senegambia was high because it had to be transported over land while steel arrived from Europe by water. Even when military action was taken by Europeans in Africa during this era, it was often with the help of African allies. When the Portuguese fought without such allies, they were more than once defeated and massacred. Slaves were among the main commodities traded during this era, which preceded the era of European territorial conquests in sub-Saharan Africa. This trade was, like other trade, largely under the firm control of African rulers, and it too was suspended whenever this suited the interests of those rulers. By the time, centuries later, when the balance of power swung decisively against the Africans, the vast Atlantic slave trade no longer existed. The slave trade with the Western Hemisphere had been virtually annihilated before the European scramble for Africa began in the 1880s, and slavery itself was banned by all Western Hemisphere nations by 1888. 
when Brazil became the last of these nations to emancipate slaves. Several factors influenced the belated efforts of European imperialist powers to conquer Africa, centuries after they had conquered the Western Hemisphere. Perhaps the most decisive difference between the two conquests was the simple fact that disease was an enormously powerful ally of the Europeans in their conquests of the American Indians, who died in great numbers from the spread of diseases from Europe, while disease was an enormously powerful ally of the Africans in resisting European incursions. With the passing centuries, however, the use of quinine and other medical advances enabled Europeans to live in, and therefore to conquer, tropical regions. Meanwhile, the progress of European weaponry, especially the use of rifling and gun barrels to increase accuracy, turned the balance of military power decisively against those with spears or bows and arrows. At the same time, the Industrial Revolution created vastly increased amounts of wealth, from which European governments could easily obtain the resources required for expensive campaigns of imperial expansion, while the absence of such developments in much of the rest of the world made for a huge disparity in power that promoted European imperialism. The readiness with which the African continent succumbed to European colonial powers was one measure of this disparity. Even a small European country like Belgium, a pawn in Europe's power politics, could carve out a huge portion of Central Africa as its empire, calling it the Belgian Congo. Portugal, a country both small and relatively backward by European standards, had an even larger colonial empire in Africa. Major European powers like Britain and France took over African territory several times their own size. Not all this was achieved through sheer military power on the battlefield. On the contrary, both the conquerors and the conquered tended to minimize their losses by agreeing to some form of indirect rule, in which local authorities continued in their traditional roles, or in strengthened versions of those roles under European hegemony, while the imperial power made policy through them and influenced or controlled who could act as local authorities. However, such abrogations of African sovereignty were not agreed to merely by persuasion, bribery, or trickery. An obvious and enormous military disparity provided the context for such agreements. On those occasions when the military strength of the Europeans was directly confronted, the results were often disastrous for the Africans. When an outnumbered group of British troops defeated Ashanti warriors in 1873, inflicting far more casualties than they suffered, it was a pattern that was to be repeated elsewhere on the continent over the years. At the historic Battle of Omdurman, near Khartoum, in 1898, 20,000 British-led troops easily defeated 60,000 Sudanese, slaughtering many thousands and losing only a few hundred of their own soldiers. Smaller punitive expeditions similarly applied the Europeans' military superiority to secure African compliance. Not only European governments, but even private companies or groups of white settlers were able to seize control in various parts of Africa, primarily through the technological superiority of their weapons. Private groups of Arabs, likewise, set up their own little fiefdoms in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Here and there, Africans won historic battles, but ultimately the weight of technology, wealth, and organization were all against them, and ultimately they succumbed. In particular places, such as early twentieth-century Tanganyika, the fighting might be fierce for years, but such fighting often represented the all-out efforts of Africans against a minor portion of the manpower and firepower available to the Europeans. Where Europeans were not prepared to make larger commitments of men and resources to African colonization, a modus vivendi might be reached with the more formidable African forces, such as the Maasai in East Africa, as a prudent alternative to warfare. But the terms of such agreements, as they evolved over the years, extended European control, even if not always to total subjugation. In one way or another, virtually the entire continent of Africa was conquered by various European powers, in part because such conquest used up relatively little of these nations' total military or economic resources, rather than because of any great value of these African possessions. All sorts of special interests in Europe, missionaries, businessmen, politicians, or the military, had their own reasons to urge the creation and expansion of colonialism in Africa, 
but officials responsible for the public treasury were often opposed, viewing the matter in terms of financial costs and gains. In special cases, such as the Congo or South Africa, with their valuable mineral resources, the conquest might repay its costs, but these were exceptions rather than the rule. In a later era, when the costs of maintaining European rule became higher, whether in financial, military, or political terms, vast areas of Africa were abandoned as rapidly as they had once been conquered. Almost all the countries on this huge continent achieved independence within a span of two decades, beginning around the middle of the twentieth century. While pre-colonial Africa had its own economic skills, institutions, and social patterns, the coming of European civilization nevertheless had a profound impact, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where Europeans often introduced the plow, literacy, wheeled vehicles, and other fundamental advances, along with much suffering associated with conquest and continuing subjugation. The mere imposition of law and order, the cessation of intertribal warfare as the colonial powers established their hegemony over the contending Africans, had profound economic implications, as it once had in Roman Britain or later in Scotland. For example, land once too militarily vulnerable to cultivate could now be farmed. Thus, although whites seized vast amounts of land in Rhodesia, Africans there cultivated more of their own land than they had before the European conquests. European medicine, railroads, schools, and numerous commercial products also transformed Africa's economies and cultures. Europe's economic impact on Africa was far greater than Africa's economic effect on Europe. Contrary to various economic theories of imperialism, Africa was not a major outlet for European investment or exports. In the early twentieth century, Britain's investments in Canada alone were larger than its investments in Africa and India put together, and more British money went to the United States than to Canada. France and Germany were likewise reluctant to sink much of their money into Africa. Commercial trade with Africa was similarly trivial for the economies of the European imperial powers. On the eve of the First World War, Germany exported more than five times as much to a small country like Belgium than to its own colonial empire, which was larger than Germany itself. France likewise exported ten times as much to Belgium as to all its vast holdings in Africa. Out of Germany's total exports to the world, less than one percent went to its colonies in Africa. Africa was somewhat more significant to Europe as a source of imports, though most of these imports to Europe from Africa came from a relatively few places, such as the South African gold mines and diamond fields, or West Africa's cocoa and palm oil regions. Overall, Britain received less than 7% of its imports from Africa, less than from any other continent, including thinly populated Australia. Nor were African colonies usually important sources of profit to European investors, or of revenue to European governments. German colonies, for example, in the years leading up to World War I, consistently absorbed expenditures greatly exceeding the revenues raised within the colonies, with taxpayers in Germany having to make up the difference. In the private economy, of nineteen firms owning sisal plantations in German colonies, only eight paid dividends. Only four out of twenty-two firms with cocoa plantations paid dividends, as did only eight out of fifty-eight rubber plantations, and only three out of forty-eight diamond mining companies. Viewed from Africa, however, the situation looked quite different. While trade with Africa was a small part of the total international trade of the European colonial powers, trade with these powers was a substantial portion of the total international trade of the African colonies. Moreover, African exports and imports grew substantially during the colonial era. In German East Africa, for example, exports of peanuts, rubber, cocoa, coffee, and sisal all grew several-fold in the relatively brief period from 1905 to 1913. Similarly dramatic increases in exports from British, French, and Belgian colonies in Africa occurred between 1938 and 1958. Correspondingly, Africa had rising imports, as well as more consumption of locally produced goods, both raising the living standards of Africans. Real consumption in the Belgian Congo, for example, rose 77% in less than a decade, between 1950 and 1958. 
In addition, the European impact on colonial Africa included creation of virtually the whole modern industrial and commercial sectors of many African countries. Europeans also introduced new crops and new farming techniques, as well as creating the modern infrastructure of roads, harbor facilities, rail lines, telegraphs, motor transport, and the like. One small indication of what this meant economically is that a single railroad boxcar could carry as much freight as 300 human beings, the usual method of transport in much of Africa, and could cover in two days a distance that would take a caravan two months. In addition to the economic changes directly attributable to the European conquerors, the consolidation of vast regions of Africa under a new law and order encouraged large-scale immigration of entrepreneurial groups from India and Lebanon, and these Indians and Lebanese created new retail and even international trade networks in East and West Africa, respectively. So dominant did the Indians become over vast regions of East Africa that the rupee became the prevailing currency in much of that region. However, just as Indians and Lebanese settled in Africa mostly after European imperial rule was established there, so many of them departed, or were forced out, after colonial rule ended. In the meantime, however, they added greatly to the economic development of the African continent. These benefits were by no means without high costs. In addition to deaths from military action during the initial conquests, and often later suppressions of uprisings, there were numerous abuses, injustices, and even atrocities committed against Africans by the conquerors. Forced labor was one of the most widespread and most deeply resented of the chronic abuses to which conquered Africans were subjected. The conditions of this forced labor, like everything else, varied greatly from colony to colony and from time to time. Even among contract laborers, however, conditions could be dire. In the Portuguese colony of Angola, during the closing decades of the 19th century, no contract laborer who went to the offshore island of Sao Tome was ever known to have returned alive. After an uprising of the Herero people in German southwest Africa in 1904 had begun with a massacre of 123 Europeans, a German general ordered his soldiers to kill every Herero, armed or unarmed, whether men, women, or children. An estimated 60,000 out of the 80,000 Herero were in fact killed before the general was recalled to Berlin. Not all the conquests in sub-Saharan Africa were by Europeans or by nation-states. The great imbalance of power created by firearms enabled freelance adventurers, whether Arab or European, to move into the more isolated or backwards regions of the continent and carve out small empires for themselves whether to seize and farm the land like the Boers of southern Africa, or to collect tribute and slaves, as Arabs and Swahilis did farther north. These freelance conquests antedated the larger imperialism of European nation-states, which swallowed them up, along with African states and communities, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The most dramatic confrontation between these freelance empires and the new imperialism of European nation-states were the two Boer Wars, in which Britain imposed its rule on the existing independent republics that had been established by white settlers of predominantly Dutch ancestry, but who were no longer connected with the government of the Netherlands. 